Presenting Real Preachers of Genius. Real Preachers of Genius. Today we salute you, Mr. Door-to-Door Evangelist Guy. Mr. Door-to-Door Evangelist Guy. Just when we thought we were safe and sound in our homes, you show up and start knocking. Armed only with a few tracks, a Bible, and that perky smile, you're ready to tick off half the neighborhood. You better start running. Girl Scout cookies, good. You at our door on a Saturday morning, bad. Very bad. You gotta love those cookies. If you were to die today, do you know you would have a home in heaven? Keep talking, and you just might find out. Turn the other cheek. The Avon lady, the vacuum cleaner guy, the Jehovah's Witness, the paper boy. Competition's tough, but you know you're on a mission from God. Watch out world, here I come. Quick, turn the lights off and hide. The last words just before you start knocking. Sure, there's danger, dogs, angry people, and women in nighties. Oh, how you suffer for the gospel. Give a honey, Satan. So here's to you, almighty solicitor of salvation. We hear you knocking, but you just can't come in. Mr. Door to Door Evangelist Guy. Oh my, yeah. <laughs> this is final week in our series called Real Christians of Genius. And in this series we've been talking about a lot of things uh, that Paul talked about in the book of Galatians, particularly the problem that the Galatians had with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and probably most, uh, one of the most widely misunderstood and severely misrepresented con concepts in the entire Bible is the question of how a person is saved. How do you get saved? Um, and actually, I'd have to say that whatever your answer to that question is, whatever, however it is that you answer that question, uh, everything else that we do or don't do in life stems from our answer to that question. Uh, probably everything else that we do in life. I mean, that's a pretty broad statement, but I think it's true that however we answer the, the question of how we are saved also has a lot to do with all of the other decisions that we make in life in one way or another. Okay, so the Galatians uh, church is this case in point of, of people who misunderstood what the gospel is and what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross and those kind of things. So Paul asked the question to Galatians 3.1. He said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus was crucified? Um, and what you need to know, I think I mentioned this last week, is that you know uh, Paul is not asking uh, before whose eyes was Jesus crucified as though... He's expecting, you know, Paul or, or I mean, uh, Barnabas or, or Timothy or somebody like that to raise their hand and say, I was, I was, I was there, you know. No, he's saying that what he did was he presented them clearly with the gospel of Jesus Christ and presented clearly to them the fact that Jesus had died on the cross and what he had done and what he had accomplished on the cross there at that time. So actually what this is is an indictment against the Galatians, uh, meaning that that Paul had clearly uh, explained all of those facts to them, and yet they were still falling back into their old ways and their old ideas and all those different kind of things that they were taught in the religious world at some point in time in, in earlier times. So um, Paul had already taught, taught them clearly that the, that, uh, of the, well, what some call the finality of the cross. Uh, the fact that at the cross Jesus had taken the sins of the whole world upon himself. He had paid the penalty of sin for every person once for all. That so, so meaning that sin no longer stands between any person and God. That sins are not the issue. And Paul had clearly explained to them the fact that by, by the forgiveness of the sins that, 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 that they, Jesus did on the cross, that the sins issue was totally finished. There wasn't anything else that, was, that needed to be done. There was nothing else that was keeping them separated from Jesus Christ at all. Um, so the problem is, is that a lot of people, or most, most of the religious world believes, and as the Galatians were beginning to believe again, is that the forgiveness of sins is salvation. Well, the forgiveness of sins is not salvation. Asking Jesus to forgive you your sins is not what saves you. 
So the problem that most people have with that whole concept, of course, when I say that, when you hear that, the problem that most people have, the majority of our world has with that whole idea, is, which is really the, the same thing that the, the whole religious world uh, teaches just the opposite, actually, uh, whether it's Protestant or Catholic or whoever it might be, is that they, they believe that the forgiveness of sins is what constitutes salvation. That having your sins forgiven is not only what saves you, but is also what keeps you right with God. That's why you've got to keep confessing your sins and keep your life up to date and you know, do the right things and don't do the wrong things. And if you do the wrong things, be sure and ask God to forgive you so that you can keep things up to date and, and your relationship with God will be clear and, uh, and God will still bless your life and you won't get uh, you know, all, you know, bad stuff happen to you, all those kind of things. You know? So last time we spent a little time together, uh, last time we were together last week, um, looking at the misrepresentation and the total misinterpretation, actually, of what is commonly known as the Romans Road. We went through that last week. If you weren't here, check it out online. You can look at that. Uh, pretty interesting, I think, some of the things that we've been taught about what, what salvation includes, how you get saved, all those different kind of things. Um, and, uh, and they use the Romans Road as supposed proof that sins are what stands in the way between us and God. And as we found last week, it doesn't even say that. Even the verses that they use to try to, as supposed proof, uh, to prove that fact, don't even say that. Don't, don't even say that even, even remotely. So nothing could be further from the truth as far as sins are what's standing between, up, between us and God. So along with that, then, I also promised you that today we'd be talking about the other side of that issue. I promise you that today we'd be looking at uh, what the Bible really has to say about what is the way of salvation. How is a person saved? Um, so here's the question I hope that you're asking yourself about this time, and that is that if every person's sins have already been forgiven, if the sin issue is not what's standing between us and God, if our sins are not what is, uh, is, uh, keeps a person, you know, uh, uh, it keeps, God's, God, keeps you at God's arm's length, you know, he doesn't want to get close to you, if that's not the problem, then, then the question is, isn't everybody already on their way to heaven? Uh, uh, yeah, all God, all God go to heaven. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, that's the idea. That's what usually comes to people's mind when I say that, the, that sins are not the issue in salvation. That having your sins forgiven is not what saves you. And if, when people hear that, they say, well, well, doesn't that mean that everybody's automatically on their way to heaven then? Well, <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a great question, and I'm glad you asked that question, so we're going to answer it. Uh, Actually, the reason why we always seem to want to ask that question, even after knowing that sins are not what stand between us and God, is because we're still thinking, I mean, we wouldn't ask that question if we didn't still think that our sins are what is separating us from God. Right? In other words, we ask that question because we think, well, if our sins have already been forgiven, then we're on our way to heaven. Well, that... That's like saying sins are what keeps us separated from God. Same, same thing. It's like saying, well, I still believe that sins are what keeps us separated from God, so if my sins aren't separating me from God, then, am I, then I must be on my way to heaven, right? Everything's okay. It means everybody's, every, everybody's good, you know? Uh, we're still thinking that our sins is what, what God is mad at us about. You know, like, like, like when you was kids in school and the girls had cooties, you know? Actually, I don't think I ever went through that stage. <laughs> Girls never had cooties for me. I don't, it just didn't happen. I, I don't know. They say little boys go through this, time, this point in time in their lives where they don't like little girls. That didn't happen with me. I don't know. Maybe I'm weird. Anybody else like that? Don't, don't raise your hand. I already admitted it for you. I'll take the heat. <laughs> you know? God, and God isn't doing that. God doesn't think we've got cooties because we do bad things or we sin or whatever the case might be. Uh, it's not that God doesn't want to catch cooties from us. I, now I was taught, uh, when I was a kid in, in, in church, and I was raised in church, I was taught, as probably a lot of you were, that since God is sinless and perfect and holy, and I was taught in that way, that, and, and I don't think there's any doubt about that idea, that God is sinless and God is perfect and He is holy. Holy meaning that He is totally other. He's not... Uh, a part of us or this, he's totally other, he's the one who created this, us in this world, 
that uh, that since those things are true about God, then it's obvious that then that He cannot tolerate and or will not tolerate sin in His presence. Therefore, since I'm a sinner, since I know that I sin on a daily and maybe in a moment-by-moment basis, then God can't allow me into His presence. That means that the only way I can come into God's presence, and that's the way I was taught, is that, or, or that God will have anything to do with me, is by getting my sins forgiven. And once I get my sins forgiven, then God can, then I don't have cooties, at least for that uh, split second or however long that is, and, and that's when I can go into God's presence or if God will come into my presence. And that's, and, that, and, and here again, that's supposedly where Jesus comes into the picture, right? You, I was taught that since God is holy and perfect and good and righteous and all those different kind of things, and I'm not, I'm the opposite, then God can't come into my presence. I can't go into God's presence. Well, once, once we've asked forgiveness of our sins, what we got for forgiveness of our sins, well, that's where Jesus comes into picture, you know? So that if you ask for forgiveness of your sins, uh, uh, you know, each and every one of your sins uh, at the moment you committed them or whatever, and mean it, you know, you've got you to be sincere in that, then God will accept me and will begin blessing my life again. But I got to tell you, nothing can be further from the truth. That's not even what the Bible says. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus took care of that sin issue once for all. Okay. So how can that be? How is that possible? How in the world could, does that even compute in, in our minds at all? Well, I want to take a look at a couple of verses out of the book of Colossians today. Uh, Colossians chapter 2 verses 13 and 14 gives us a pretty clear rundown of what's going on because and I've highlighted a couple of verse, words here and and when is a past tense right uh, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcised in your, uh, of your flesh he made you alive together with him having and you could maybe in English you could put having already, right, it's a past tense thing, having already forgiven us all our transgressions, having, again, already canceled out the certificate of debt. And what is this certificate of death, debt? What does it consist of? It consists of decrees against us, which were hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now that's a long way of saying that at the cross, Jesus took care of all of those previous things that we just talked that he just talked about in verse 13 and 14, right? The end result is, is that he's saying that all of those things have been nailed to the cross, and all of those things are out of the way now. All the things that we used to do or things, our sins, whatever it was that was, was keeping us separated from God, Jesus took care of at the cross. It's a done deal. So let's follow this through for a moment then. Let's, let's check this out. Let me see if I can help us to come to a better understanding of what's going on here. Let me ask you a few questions. Um, and I want you to answer honestly to yourself. Uh, uh, how many, first question, how many of your sins, how many of your sins did God know about before you were born? All of them. Well, God is omniscient, right? God is an all-knowing God. God is Jehovah Jireh. Uh, your name is Jireh. Uh, and and uh, Jehovah Jireh means, and I, I say it this way, the God who's already been there. Uh, Sheldon says the God who sees ahead. I prefer, personally, the God who's already been there because when you get there, you find out he was already there. Right? So how many sins then did God know about, of your sins did God know about before you were, before you were even born? Well, all of them. All of them. Uh, he already knew about all of your sins before you were even conceived, uh, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, ten thousand years ago, however long you want, to, you want to make that time. Second question. How many of your sins did he record on your certificate of debt? How many of those sins were recorded on the debt that you owe God for the sins that you have, uh, have committed, are committing, and will commit? How many of those sins have been re were you recorded on your certificate of debt? 
All of them. All of them. He knew about all of them before you were born. And since he knew about all of them before you were born, then on the certificate of debt that you owe him, the sin that you owe him, all of those sins were recorded there. He already knew about them. So here's the debt that you owed to God. Or some people call it the sin debt as Paul, that Paul mentioned. Uh, all of them. God knew about all of those. So if God, already got, if God already knew about all of your sins before you were born and had already recorded them on your certificate of debt before you were ever created in your mother's womb, then the third question is, then how many of those sins did Jesus pay for on the cross? All of them. Why? Because all of them were still in the future. Before you had even committed a single one of them. Last question. So how many, how many sins was Jesus referring to on the cross when he said, It is finished. All of them. Every, all of them for every person. Again, I, I'm saying to you, the sin issue is over. It's done. Our sins, your sins, my sins, no one's sins are standing between any person and God. Okay, if you don't think that that's what God had in mind to begin with, well, then look what... The writer of Hebrews, who I think is Paul, that's my opinion, and there's a lot of other opinions on that matter. Um, according, he quotes out of the Old Testament. He quotes about what God says about this issue in the Old Testament, not the New Testament, before anything had ever taken place, before that issue had ever actually been dealt with, handled, uh, taken care of by Jesus on the cross. This is what God wrote in the, in the Old Testament. He said, this is the covenant that I will make with them. Who's them? Well, let's find out. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws upon their heart and on their mind, and I will write them, and, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Okay, so the question is, uh, first of all, I guess, who is them? And then the, the other question is, what, what are those days that he's talking about? After those days. Well... Uh, those days that he's talking about here are after the death, burial, resur and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is that exact same age in history that we live right now. It's that even the, even the calendar changed, right? Uh, here we are at 2013 already. Good grief. <laughs> wow, where did time go, huh? Uh, and... And, and from that point on, he said, from that point on until the second coming of Christ is, is all of those people, those are them. That's us. And after those days is after the days when Jesus Christ was not living on this earth and was died, buried, and rose again. After those days, he said, I will remember their sins no more. The sin issue is not there. That's Old Testament, people. God said it way back then. He said, this is what's to come. I'm telling you about it early so you, you're, not, you're not confused. Now, if you don't believe that's the case, then, then check out what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 5, verses 18 and 19. He says, Now all these things are from God who did what? Reconciled. How many of you ever reconciled a bank statement? I haven't. <laughs> Maxine's the smart one in our family. <laughs> she does that. <laughs> I think I could probably do it if I found a little guidance. <laughs> Reconciling means that you bring both ends together and you, and you come out with zero, right? Everything's fine. It's all cool. This is really an accounting word. Reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Well, what's he reconciling? Well, the sin issue, of course, right? All those sins that we have committed, are committing, and will commit. All of those sins that we would commit after those days when our mom became pregnant with us, we were born in the hospital and lived to be 102. 
those are the days then that he reconciled. All those sins during those days, he reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, in other words, specifically, here's what I'm talking about. That God was in Christ reconciling the world. You mean it's not just reconciling those who have asked forgiveness of their sins and, and promised never to sin anymore and walked the aisle and, and uh, prayed the sinner's prayer and had their sins forgiven? Not what he says there, is it? Because we know the world has not done that. Nor do they intend to at this moment in time. Until the Holy Spirit touches their heart and their life. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Doing what? Again, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us. Who's us? Well, that'd be us, right? Those of us who have received Christ, who know what the true, truth of the gospel is, who are, are believers in Jesus Christ, those of us who know who Jesus Christ is and believe that he is who he says he is, has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Wow. The ministry of what? The ministry of reconciliation. Have you thought about that? It's not the ministry which the, our, which the religious world teaches us, which the majority of the world teaches us today, the vast majority of the religious world teaches us today, is that, oh no, we have the ministry of sin and separation. We have the ministry of telling you what a bar terrible, awful... Uh, dirty, rotten sinner you are and getting your, and you're separated from God because of your sin so you better get your life straightened out and get, your, get everything forgiven if you want to go to heaven. Is that what that says? No. I say no. The ministry of reconciliation is not the ministry of sin and separation. It's specifically the ministry of reconciliation because God has already reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against, against them. That's the world. And then to us who have received that, who know that, who know Jesus Christ, he said to us he has given us then this ministry of telling people that this is what the gospel is. <laughs> this is the good news that God has given us. That he's already reconciled us to himself. And our sins are not standing between us and God. Not counting our sins to get. I mean, how awesome is that, huh? Wow, unbelievable. The sin issue is over. Okay. We still haven't really answered the question then of how we are saved then, are we? have we? If the sin issue is over with, dealt with, done with, God has already reconciled us to himself, every person, the entire world. If our sins are not what's keeping us out of heaven or sending us to hell, then how is a person saved? Because just having your sins forgiven does not mean you're on your way to heaven. Well, if that's the case, then how is, how does a person get into heaven? How, how do you get eternal life? Right? The fact again, uh, again, the vast majority of the Christian religions, re a Christian or religious world today, fails to understand that salvation is a life and death issue, not a sins issue. It's not a sins issue, it's a life and death issue. In other words, our problem today is that we simply lack the life of Christ within us because Jesus is life himself. Okay, now in order to actually, um, and, and hopefully this won't be too torturous for those of you if we talked about this before, especially those of you online, have you ever, have you ever heard of this before? Here, here we go. In order to really answer this question more fully and correctly, it, it's almost imperative that we go back to the book of Genesis and see what happened to Adam and Eve when they sinned in the garden, right? 
Probably every person already knows, I, I mean, ask any cool school kid, probably every person already knows that Adam and Eve disobeyed God by eating of the forbidden fruit, and, and because of that, God cast them out of the Garden of Eden. So what Satan wants us to think about this whole issue, what a, Satan wants us to believe about this issue is that God was so angry with Adam and Eve for disobeying him that their disobedience was their sin and God is so pissed off that he threw them out of the garden. Have you been taught that? Yeah. Uh, maybe you just naturally believe that, actually. I think it's a natural human response. But what you need to know is that that's not what happened. <laughs> I mean, go back and read it, and, you'll, and what you'll find out is that, well, let's, let's start with what we do know. Let's, let's start there. What do we know? We, we do know that Adam and Eve did sin by eating of the forbidden fruit. There's no doubt about that. We also know that God did have to force them out of the Garden of Eden. And you notice I said had to force them out rather than threw them out or cast them out, which a lot of translations have, as though it's an angry action by God, on God's behalf. And yes, the curse of sin did follow them and all of humanity from that day forward. However, the most important question, which most have failed to answer correctly, is what is the curse of sin? Now, I'm going to tell you that the reason why God had, had to throw them out or cast them out or drove them out, actually, actually the correct word is drove them out, is because they didn't want to go. Would you? No. <laughs> no, I wouldn't either. But the problem was if they, if they went back in and ate of the tree of life, they would live forever like this. No thanks. In and out of the hospital, sick one day, a little better the next. You know, some days are good, some ain't. You know, for some of us, we have a few good days and a lot of bad days. For some of us, we have a lot of good days and a few bad days. Maybe a lot of it has to do with how we look at it. I don't know. So that's what God said here. Uh, you remember what God said would happen with them when the, in the moment they ate of the forbidden fruit? Well, look at it. Genesis 2.17, God said, But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day, and that's important, in the day that you eat of it, eat from it, you will surely die. Now, in the day is, is the same thing as saying, at the very moment that you eat of it, you will surely die. Did Adam and Eve die on that day? We know that they didn't because we can, we can turn over to the next chapter or two and find out that Adam lived to be 930 some odd years old. He was just a youngster by, by about six or seven years from Methuselah, who was the oldest man in the Bible, six, 600 and whatever he was, 37 or whatever that was, you know? So they obviously did not die physically on that day. Uh, so either God lied about them dying immediately as they, when they ate that fruit, or God was talking about some other death. Well, of course, he was talking about spiritual death. So what exactly is spiritual death? <laughs> you know, that sounds, that's an odd term for a lot of us, isn't it? Spiritual death? What do you mean spiritual death? Well, since Adam and Eve's sin was the fact that they knew better than, they thought they knew better than God did. Their sin was not eating of the fruit. Their sin was thinking that they knew better than God, than God did about this whole uh, forbidden fruit thing. Uh, and said, hey, uh, God, we don't need you more. We can make our own decisions from this point on. We know what's right and, and what's wrong. We, we, can, we can do this on our own. We don't need you anymore, you know. We don't need you interfering in, in our affairs. So uh, if you just kind of step aside for a while, we appreciate it. You know, and God honored their decision to go it on their own and withdrew his life from them, leaving them spiritually dead. Why? Because Jesus said to the woman at the well, God is spirit. If God is spirit and he withdrew his life from them, then they are spiritually dead lacking the life of God within them anymore. 
And so from that point on, Adam and Eve could not pass on to their children what they no longer possessed themselves, spiritual life, God's life within them. So they're spiritually dead. They could not pass on to their children what they no longer possessed themselves. So from that point on, uh, spiritual death then is the curse of sin, not physical death as many of us have been taught. The curse of sin is not physical death. As a matter of fact, physical death is, is a blessing uh, in sin, not the curse of sin. Because all of us are going to get to that point someday, sometime in our lives when we're saying to ourselves and to God, I'm done, man. I, I can't do this no more. I, I, need, I need out of here. You know? Whether it's due to age, due to some kind of deadly disease, uh, terrible suffering, whatever, you know? Would you want to get to the point in your life where you were suffering so terribly that you wish you could just expire and couldn't, knowing that you couldn't forever? Wow. No, spiritual death. God withdrawing his life from them is what he was talking about. And that's exactly what Paul says in Romans 5, 12. He says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and what? Death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. Spiritual death, not physical death. <laughs> Spiritual death. That Adam and Eve could no longer pass on to their children what they no longer possessed themselves. Okay, so how then is a person, we've been trying to come to that, haven't we? How many times do I have to answer, ask that question before I finally answer it? Huh? Come on! How then is a person saved? Certainly not by having your sins forgiven. Jesus died on the cross to take care of that issue. It's over for the whole world. We read that. And when he died, he clearly said, it is finished. The sin issue is over. That is the significance of the cross. That's what Jesus did at the cross. However, again, what most have failed to understand and to see is that Jesus rose again on the third day so that we might have life in his name. He took care of the sin issue three days prior. Spent three days in the grave, rose again on the third day that we might have life in his name. Took care of the sin issue. Now what they need is life within them again. My life within them again. Now that I've taken care of anything and everything that could possibly keep me from living within them, now this is available. As a matter of fact, that's exactly why John could say in 1 John 5, 12, He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. And I'm going to tell you here, uh, this is important. Uh, it, it, it won't cost you nothing. If, you're, if the translation that you, in your Bible that you're reading does not have the word the there, the, however you say it, the, the life, uh, write it in there because it is definitely there in the original language. He's not talking about just life of some kind. Uh, you know, he's talking about the life. Well, who is the life? Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? I am life himself. So to possess Jesus, to possess the Son, is to possess the life. And without possessing Him, you do not possess the life. Okay, to define it a little bit, a little bit more, the life is Jesus Christ, who is eternal life Himself. So eternal life is not this, uh, some kind of concept where you live forever. No, eternal life is Jesus Christ himself, and when we possess him within ourselves, we have eternal life. Now, 
Not after you die. Now. You, you already don't have it. It's there. Nothing can change that. Because the sin issue is, is not an issue anymore. So to possess Jesus is to possess eternal life himself. It's not about sin. <coughs> it's not about all those kind of things. It's a life and death issue. The fact that we are dead because of sin, dead spiritually because of sin, lacking the life of Christ is within us because of the sin issue. And since Jesus Christ already taken care of that sin issue, then we don't have to ask for forgiveness in order to make things right. He's already reconciled us to himself and committed to us the ministry of reconciliation, telling people all over the world that your sins are not standing between you and God, that what you need is just simply to, to receive his life within you, to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And that's exactly what Romans 10, 9, uh, the tail end of that Romans road says, that if you confess, and confess again is to agree with God, to say the same thing as, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of your life. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Why do we need to believe that God raised him from the dead? Because he is life. Exactly, because he's life. He, he rose again on the third day when I have life in his name. He died to take care of the sin issue. That's important, to know that he died. And then to admit that and to say, thank you, Lord. That you've already taken care of my sin. That that's not what's standing between you and me. And I believe that you are who you say you are. That you rose again on the third day that I might have life in, in your name. So it's not the confession of sin. It doesn't say confess your sins there. It says confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. Make him the Lord of your life. So it's not about saying any magic words like, you know, forgive me of my sins and come to my heart or whatever. Nor is it living the kind of life that pleases God. It's not about that. As though God some is, is somehow appeased by the things that we do or don't do. Instead, it's simply about believing in your heart that Jesus is who he says he is. Uh, let's stop here. Uh, we're going to quit here. Ch check out again, check this out again, what John says in John 20, 31. He says, but these have been written. All the things that God wrote in his by this, all the things we've been talking about here this morning, these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is who he says he is, the Son of God, and that believing you may have... You mean that it's not believing we have, uh, believing that we'll have our sins forgiven? Doesn't say that, does it? But that's what we've been taught. And it's always in our heads. We're always thinking that. I, I, I'm always thinking that. You know, since I was raised that way and we're taught to believe that and all those kind of things, and whenever you read this stuff, you think, well, okay, then that's because, you know, I'm, I'm getting my sins forgiven here. No, he doesn't even say that. doesn't even say that. He said that believing we might have life in his name, not believing that your sins have been forgiven, you know, that as you, as you ask forgiveness, believing that Jesus is who he says he is and he did what he said he did. It is finished. Making him Lord of your life, you have life. In his, it's a life and death issue. Not whether you sin or don't sin. <laughs> Is God awesome or what? Wow. Hey, I know it's a long road to get here. Was it worth it? I think it was. <laughs> awesome. Lord bless you all. Amen. Give God a hand.